sponsored by the Dunleary Rattown Local Enterprise Office. You're listening to Business Eye on Dublin South FM. Hello folks, yes, it is a bank holiday weekend. It's the summertime. We're coming up to the longest day of the year. And even though it's coming up to that time, it feels like the last six months has flown in. Um, being in lockdown and living in my little pod, um, the months are just slipping by. But with lockdown ending, I know that the uh, government to be, or our government uh, set new rules um, or extended rules for the next six months to regarding this pandemic crisis that they're calling it. Um, and there's other there's other rules and regulations that are slid in behind there as well. So we, we'll be excited to see what they are over the next couple of months to see if we um, we comply, we comply. But that's my moan over. Uh, Simon, how are you? How's all in Dublin? It's good. I, you're the half a year's flown by. I just noticed at the front of the house, the leaves are starting to fall off the trees. You know, it's not even midsummer. And then it reminded me of... Sunday, January the 8th, my wife and I walked down to Sandy Mount and the sea had frozen. So where are those six months gone? And I have a question for you, Joe, uh, around the pandemic stuff. The government's talking about reducing the gap of 12 weeks to eight weeks for the AstraZeneca second jab. My question is, if they had thought this through scientifically and got all the best advice and 12 weeks was a definitive time, how come 33% less is now an okay definitive time? What do you think? Well, I would like to get out my magic ball and try and rub it and see actually what, who's making decisions or how they are making these decisions. Sometimes I think they just get up in the morning with a whim and go, let's do this. So yes, um, there, is, there is stuff coming out on all those um jabs as one would say um and what's the cause and effect for them as well but we'll soon find out but to do with your trees as well with the leaves falling off maybe someone's put down some weed killer <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that's it yes on it. <laughs> and today folks we have two great people uh people who are listening to this show on a regular basis will know brian brian has been um advising us many times on banking and also has co-hosted the show when simon was stuck and also we have eddie hobbs and people will know eddie hobbs from around the world uh, Eddie has wrote books, uh, he has written papers, and he has been on TV as well. So welcome, both of you. We're very honoured to have two wise old men, I should say, <laughs> on the show. And that's myself and Simon, and yeah, two yeah. young people <laughs> as well, two young as well. So welcome, guys. Welcome. Thanks, to Today, I wanted to speak to uh, about what's going on. We know that um, the banking and the, the economy is, has been sort of under pressure with lockdown and a lot of small businesses um, closed. And I've had this gut feeling um, for the last couple of months that I feel with all this money being lent out and all these people not being able to do business, that it's going to, and with Brexit, that it's going to cause hyperinflation uh, coming down the road. So I just want to uh, open it up to yourselves. Um, Eddie, we'll start with yourself. What's yeah. your thoughts? What's your thoughts on, on what's coming down the road regarding hyperinflation? Well, I've been I've been closely monitoring, um, you know, where all this is going to end up at the end of successive waves of money printing. Remember, this goes back to 2008, 2009. It goes back further than that, but let's not go into ancient history. So we've had massive intervention by, by an excess of global central banks led by the Fed, you could argue the world central bank because it is controlling the world reserve currency, setting the pace. And, um, and this time, you know, when you get inflation, it's always, it's always a monetary phenomenon. In other words, it's from printing too much money. And this hasn't happened so far because arguably the, um, the, you know, the, the, the quality of the money printing the last time was different in the sense that it was going into banks to save them from collapse back in the day, global financial crisis. And then the money would be pulled out in the form of credit. But consumers weren't really absorbing more credit. They were terrified and they were deleveraging, especially in the United States and especially in Ireland as well, over the last decade and longer. Uh, and But this time around, what's happened is that central bank dole, which had been going out to countries, uh, then, then went out to corporates, and we know that roughly about a quarter 
or 20% to a quarter of all the US big companies, top 3,000 companies are zombies. In other words, they couldn't service their debt if interest rates rise. They, they just were continued on. So therefore, the there was interference in, in free markets, in other words, where the, the, the more efficient would take over the inefficient. All that was interrupted. You create very soggy economies. You distort capital is no longer going to the, its most efficient use. It's getting diverted elsewhere. All this has been going on in the background. And people like a lot of people, myself included, have been saying this is this is not going to end well. And, and what is going to be the outcome? Now, there was always the risk along the way that we would have another deflationary collapse like we had back in the day. That didn't happen because every time it was threatened, they printed more money. And that happened again at the end of 2018. There was that recent when the stock market went 20 percent in a, in a quarter and the People Bank of China and the Fed just opened up the spigots again. So along comes COVID-19. And this time the money printing is, well, there's nothing on the scale of human history that matches it. It's 25 percent of global GDP. It's just absolutely massive. So the scale of money printing this time is far in excess of the output gap, which is basically the capacity of the world economy to come up with the goods and services in reserve to meet the surge in demand. So that's always been the argument that we won't get an inflation breakout. But this time they've completely overcooked it. Uh, We are seeing inflation, folks. It's no longer a theory. It has arrived the year, the year, the year-on-year year inflation rate to April 2021 in the United States. Why does that matter? Because that's still the engine room of world growth, and a large proportion of its economy is consumer behavior. The year-on-year year inflation is 4.2 percent at the moment, so it's over four. And interest rates are near zero there as well, not as bad as over here. Now, European inflation is pegging up. We're heading towards two. I think we'll go past it. Uh, And meanwhile, this week, AIB, Bank of Ireland, bringing SME customers all over the country with the news that, sorry, folks, but we're going to have to start charging a half percent per annum for holding your money in the bank. So when you put it all together, what do you see? You see 130 billion or so in Irish household deposits getting about to get slaughtered, in other words, on negative rates, and then inflation coming in. So you add the two together to, to understand your loss. So if the U.S. inflation experience transports across the North Atlantic to Ireland, let's say 4%, just to pick a number, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just using it as an example, say 4%, and interest rates are minus a half. In 12 months, you've lost 4.5% of your money. It's gone. It's permanently gone. So what does that tell us? If this not, if this is the, the Fed and, and the, the group thinker suggesting, uh, it, Joe, that all of this is transitory, that it's a spike, and that we'll be back to normal again tomorrow, or sorry, next year. Uh, I don't accept that. I don't think it's a spike at all. Uh, I think that once the pivot point is reached where consumers take the view that next year's prices are going to be higher than this year's prices. And by the way, honey, we're now getting charged to hold our money in the bank. You can see what the what, what the movement is going to be. There'll be a capital flight out of the pain to move it into, sink it into to any type of asset that's going to hold its value, land, property, art, collectibles, you name it, spending, and um, and that itself will f- will fuel inflation. Labour then will be putting its hand up, saying, "Guys, my 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 food bill last week, one hundred and twenty euros is now one hundred and forty euros. I need a wage increase." So Labour will contest with capital employers. Labour will win because they'll have to. Prices, will, wages will go up, and of course, landlords will increase rents, and shops will increase prices because there's more money there. And now you're into a wage price spiral. That's one scenario. So the question then really is, how bad could it get? Could it get hyper? You said hyperinflation. I think it's far too soon to suggest that. Um, But what I do think is we're going to see real uh, sustained uh, inflation at uh, at, in low single digits, but still well above the deposit rate for many years. And I say many years, I mean a decade of this kind of stuff. I I would agree. Like, I mean, we're even noticing that there's a price rise. If if you mentioned there about grocery, like even going down to the local store, which we monitor every week. And even in when you're going into one of the German shops, I've noticed that the same shop, which was a couple of months ago, it's actually nearly about 12, 13 euros more expensive now at this moment. And that's just happened over the last couple of weeks. Again, you're you're talking about in Tesco's jumping on Tesco's last night to order food and they didn't a lot of the stuff wasn't in stock and going to ask the person um, who delivered it today and they says we we just have issues trying to get stuff at the moment, especially with Brexit. So all the, there's there's multiple combination of 
things which are going to cause all these issues as well. Brian, what's your thoughts on it? Well, kind of, <laughs> uh, you paint a great picture, Eddie. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, Jesus, I'm with you. And I'm sitting here going, I'm the oldest person in the room, guys, and I don't know how that happened. Okay. But I remember interest rates at 17 and 18% not so long ago. And um, in the 70s, when there was the oil crisis and, you know, people were trying to manage inflation and prices and stuff. And I think, and you might agree with me, my worry is that we don't have the skill set now in central banks and economists around most people would be probably in their 80s. Okay, and the people that have come up behind them have known nothing but good and growth and whatever. And we've proved that we didn't listen to the reasons for the property crash. We didn't, we're not listening to exactly what Eddie has said there about, you know, the corporates can't pay their bills. Well, actually, now my worry is that the countries won't be able to pay their bills. And when the countries can't pay their bills, that's where all this debt management is going to be centralized. And we won't know what's going on because, you know, as a sovereign nation in Ireland, we will lose even more control to the EU and the central banks about the way in which we're going to be to give money to survive. Mm-hmm. That That's my worry. Um, we lose that. We lose, we've already lost, and I'm not an economist, but we've lost our ability to increase our interest rates the way we used to back in the day to manage our own economy. Um, I'm just worried that we're going back to the 70s and the 80s and nobody's listening. And what Eddie is saying is perfectly correct. Can I, can I ask both of you a question? Because I haven't a clue of the answer. You know, I, 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 I work with corporates, right? And they're planning the corporate uh topography you know what they need to look like in 2030 right they're thinking about this stuff my question to both of you is let's just take the irish government is the irish government in any way looking ahead to 2030 and think and then thinking backwards what do we need to be doing in those eight or nine years i can see you both smiling but is there any of that at all going on maybe eddie first yeah go well i'm afraid the irish congenitally have never managed to join the dots ever since we won the Battle of Clontarf and all that good Northern European DNA left us and we were left with the musicians and the storytellers and the spoofers. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's the, that's the kind of tart answer to the question in practice. Uh, and I've had some, some experience of it myself. Um, we run a clientelistic political system where the local politician deems the voter to be a client that mm-hmm. needs to be serviced. And that client then turns up and with a drop of drop of ink and a pen and, and a piece of paper, uh, just simply tick the box to those that give them the greatest emotional lift every few years. And all of that stuff about policy that's knocking around is completely ignored because that's for the next parish's problem. Um, and, and then we end up with people that couldn't really survive a lot of them in the private sector, running businesses, running the country in the parliament, and we'll go around in circles wondering what the hell has happened. So the current paradigm is that we need to give the other crowd now a go. I forget the background about, you know, being run by by dark forces in Belfast. We just give them a should they'll be grand. They won't, right? The whole thing, the whole thing is the system, is the issue. And we're not getting long-term thinking and planning and neither are we rewarding it through the political system uh, in, into the ballot box. And you'll see this if you look at the, the current um, uh, by-election in was it Dublin South, right? It's all about the personalities and throwing at them and throwing back and more headlines. I mean, and then we end up with the political system. And then we're wondering why we keep going back around and around in circles, not yeah. being able to do anything like we put the children's hospital into the wrong place. And now we're borrowing out the wazoo following modern monetary theory because somebody's saying it's sexy in the Irish Times and nobody's challenging it, you know. And then when the Fiscal Advisory Council says, uh, guys, actually, this is nuts. Sure, that's just a small little story in the back end, right? That's what we are. And then when we complain, we get on to the Joe Duffy show. We've a good rant about it. 
and the late late do a few things and then we plug into prime time and RT state propaganda over the last 12 months being told this is how the world is working when the world isn't working like that at all I mean that's mm. us it's great fun right it's very entertaining but John that's thinking about what's happening in 10 years time as a country they're 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 they fill reports uh, they go on shelves mm. and they get they get a, get a 24 hour news cycle coverage mm. and then are forgotten about that's that's how we do business that's yeah, why we have a housing crisis I think I think that like the mindset of a lot of people as well is when they hear something out coming from mainstream media, which is it's not reporting or journalism, it is entertainment that they kind of go, oh, oh, someone is sorting that, someone has sorted this, someone's looking after it, and everyone gets back to be doing their lot their busy life. And I've said this multiple times before. We as a generation have taken our eye off the ball and we have probably we have learned to take our eye off the ball because of previous generations. And I think what's happening now in the world, and especially in Ireland, there's a, there is a, 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 you know, a, a, a segmentation of, mm-hmm. of people that are kind of going, you know, because of COVID and because of lockdown and because of this are actually now looking and going, hang on we've made we've made a balls of everything and we are no longer letting these people do our bidding and it's time for them to 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 act and take action and you can see that going on in the world and, and especially here as well and that that grassroots movement eddie is growing and it's growing rapidly in each county as well so hopefully 2022 will will give us that spark that or that kick up the ass that we actually need that we need uh- I'll be devil's advocate here, Joe, and I'll just go, is it? Right? Yeah, it is. Is, is it? Right? Yeah. I know people are pretty ticked off, right? Um, and I know that sacrifices have been made for the greater good. But as, as Eddie says, unless we change the way in which the politics is done. So you go into power and you decide, I'm going to build a metro. Well, there has to be some uh, accountability for the fact if you don't do that, OK, then you, you got into power for five years and you earned good money and you didn't deliver anything. And that's the history of this country. 40 years we spoke, we talked about the Lewis. And when they were about to put a shovel in the ground, I think it was Leo that came along and said, oh, we have to get a cheaper option. OK, that's what we've done in this country consistently, consistently. Now, if you remember when the progressive Democrats were started, that was okay, built out of the corruption of a different party. But it didn't last because the people in the country didn't support it. Eddie Renua, the people didn't support that. They were right. Okay. They were right. What we need what we need to do is we need to we, we need we need to do something differently and get the younger people involved now, I think. Right? You can talk about people of my generation and my parents' generation that have messed up the country. But Brian, Brian, I think it's, there is that change because I'm speaking to people in in all the different counties um, who are, you know, looking at one change. And what the people are what people are realizing as well, that the three main parties are all the same. And and yeah. if a new party is created, the mindset of people go, ah, oh, another party, they're just troublemakers, you know, and that's the attitude. And yeah. It has to be sort of, and that's because of propaganda. That if someone's coming up, the the mainstream will will if they can't knock them off, they'll do a, a hit piece on that person personally to try yeah. and knock them off. And yeah. people are seeing through all this. People are seeing through it all. But look, I I don't want to get into a political show yeah. because that 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 will send me off Sponsor, on a spark. Yeah. Sponsored by the Dunleary Rattown Local Enterprise Office. You're listening to Business Eye on Dublin South FM. Simon, Simon, you had a couple of questions there that I know you wanted to ask it back back on uh, uh, yeah, back I, on track. Yeah, I'm I'm always <laughs> thinking of the future. And I lived in Australia everything, for everything 10 is connected. Everything is connected. <laughs> I lived in Australia for 10 years, as you know, Joe, and I worked for one of the the world's biggest mining company. And I personally saw 25 30 year contracts that they'd agreed with the Chinese and the South Koreans yeah. and the Japanese. So these countries have planned, they, they've already done their planning 20 to 30 years. So my question for both of you is, and it's around tax, you know, Ireland is the fourth most intangible economy in the world per capita, which means, you know, it's where brand and IP is located. 
Um, and, you know, some people would use the words tax haven. Some people would say this is legitimate, what, what, whatever your opinion. Let's assuming that this comes to an end or starts fading out, right? What can Ireland replace you know, in t- if the U.S. multinationals start going, if this tax stuff starts going down, if you know the U.S. government or the or the French get their way, what can Ireland replace this with? Just, I'm interested in some constructive, maybe a bit of hopeful thought as well. <laughs> maybe Ed, Eddie first. Well, I'm very hopeful that we'll stumble through as we've <laughs> always done. I'm just saying we could do so much damn better. That's that's all. I mean, our political systems is is not fit for purpose. Mm. We've also got a secondary problem, and that's the hollowing out of the fourth estate is a huge problem. I mean, we are delivering mainstream media on fumes. Editors are under savage pressure. Journalists are being asked multiple articles. It's very surface stuff, and there's no really hard inquiry going on, right? So that's our media at the moment, unfortunately. A lot of it's to do with technology, competition, the legacy of all of that. But just to be clear on that, if you really want to find out what's going on, you have to go to the fringe. I think, to try and get it in Ireland anyway, especially. But back to tax, you know, and what is the intrinsic Irish asset and how are we going to get through all this? Well, firstly, there was a study done a few years ago, which was largely missed in the Irish media by the University of uh, Amsterdam called uh, Corpen. And this got together a team of economists and computer scientists, and they examined 71 million data points across, uh, across global financial accounts of all the multinationals to try and figure out what was the size of the actual money sloshing around the place that was ending up in, in tax havens? And who are the tax havens? So they found that the total amount at the time was something like 30 trillion, which is about what at the time was one and a half times US GDP in kind of just, let's call it, money sloshing around without country, right? And then they split the countries into two. Now, remembering they were examining the financial accounts, right, using AI as well to do all the work for them. It was a very good study. And they, so they split, the, they split the countries between conduits. In other words, countries through whom the money flows and sinks, where the money ends up. So where did the money end up? And all of the money ends up, right, outside of normal trading countries, right? They say, what, is, what defines a sink? And a sink is where the amount of GDP that the country has is completely off the scale to the actual value of the, the domestic economy, right? <laughs> the balances, in other words. And where are all the sinks? Well, they're in British Empire, old, the British Old Empire Islands, and the Dutch Old Empire Islands, right? That's where all the money is, right? That's where it ends up. And who are the biggest sinks? Who are the biggest conduits in the world? Well, surprise, surprise, the Dutch <laughs> and the British, right? So we're a conduit as well, right? I think I can't remember the numbers, but the Dutch were like, I don't know, Jesus, 14, 15% of the flows and the, the Brits were kind of like the same. And then there was Singapore and there was Switzerland and there was the old tricolor waving its, waving its arse in the air. But we were only conjuring about one and one and a half percent of the total amount of money. And where the money was ending up when it came to Ireland was the United States of America. It wasn't going to the old British Empire or the Dutch Empire, right? So so have we clean hands? No, we don't. But we're not as dirty as they're being painted. Right? That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that really like the Irish assets are the workforce. Uh, we have a young, the demographics are in our favour. We've lots of land. We we have uh, we have a, we have a clean economy that way because we we went straight from being an agricultural backwater to a modern economy and missed industrialization in between. We just had a famine and all those things instead, mm-hmm. right? So, so so I'm being glib about saying that, but you get the point, right? Yeah. And so so we now have um, you know we have a technology savvy. Uh, population and it's can do and that mentality all of that I think is our asset uh, we, our natural resources well we've wind we actually that's another political point right but the Irish people are unique in Europe we don't own our own natural resources just to, just to put that out there right it's owned by the state uh, it was taken it was robbed from us by by the de Valera's constitution so the state owns our, all Irish natural resources including the wind that blows across the land and the waves that come in Right, all that is owned by the state, and the state isn't the people. The people predate the state by, you could argue, thousands of years. So we we had we had ownership of our own natural resources under the Magna Carta under British rule, but we know, and then we had them under the twenty two Constitution. But by the time Dev got got 
got his paws on the constitution, he basically moved all the assets to the ownership of, well, to the state. And then he made the state non-justicable under the constitution, which means it can't be challenged. Right? Now, I remember when the water protests were going on trying to make this point, sure, they weren't interested in it. They weren't interested in the solution. They just wanted to have a march, right? We don't own our own water. So let's let's start with the basics. And then they can sell the water because we own it, the people, not the government, not the, not the state, the people, right? So and remember, the Constitution is there to protect the people from the government. So these are kind of basic concepts. Uh, but but back to the point. So so how will how will Ireland do? Well, we're members of the Fiscal and Compact Treaty. That should protect us from the nut cases who are eventually going to come in and try and push us in another direction uh, politically. That should be of assistance to us. How will Ireland fare? Well, Ireland is very much still uh, behaves like a tiger economy off the west coast of of of, of Europe because of the aforementioned assets we've got. I don't think that's going to change. Uh, there are going to be changes to the international tax regime. We can see that. We are going to start losing some corporation tax, but I don't think it's a red flag event. I don't think it's, we're just going to flip back. I think we'll find our way, or, you know, we'll find our way forward. Uh, we have a lot going for us with our domestic food industry in particular, the whole green economy thing, the young people, the education levels, the can-do attitude. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't transfer genetically. Uh, into into the doll chamber in terms of actually long term thinking and planning, so we have to kind of separate that from from the private economy. The the miracle of, of Ireland is that the actual economy, despite how the public sector is being managed, has actually done particularly well. Yeah. God yeah. knows what we we could have conquered the world if we had a public sector that could yeah. work as well as the private sector. I've always said that Eddie, the, the private economy and 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 the intellectual capital is amazing despite the system it's incredible brian beat that <laughs> no, no i agree with everything that eddie that eddie said um so capital and investment is what i believe uh and spending on infrastructure is what can help country move forward okay um it is scary that we can have the pandemic and our income tax take only goes down by 1%, yet there's so many people out of work. And if that doesn't scare anybody for our reliance on the uh, multinationals, well, I don't think anything will. Uh, we do have a fantastic, excellent, well-educated young workforce. But my worry is that where are they going to live? I've, I've heard people already talking about... Um, well, I can I can do my work and live in Spain. I can do my work and live in Portugal. I don't have to be in Ireland, okay? Um, and a lot of these people and the multinationals who have come to Ireland to live don't have to do that anymore. They can stay where they were and still do the work. Um, so that's my my worry is that we're facing another wave of of people leaving, young people leaving the country, and the smartest people will leave, and. When you when you Simon, you mentioned CEOs again, it's groupthink. They're all talking about the same thing. It's digitalization, it's climate change, and it's cyber security. Okay. And it's always taught when the horse has bolted and everything is gone. Okay. And we're playing catch up. So I think there's no point in us trying to be, we used to say, the, you know, we used to say. Ireland is so used to being in the EU, in the EU, being the best kid in the class. Okay, we're going to kill money point uh, over the next five years, while China is still building twenty-five coal plants to get out of the pandemic. It's nonsense. Yeah, but that's that's it. You know, uh, are we? As you say, you know, it, are we looking at what what's happened? And should we all be looking at what the, the, the solution is? And is that solution, you know, one thing that will people will go, well, look, at, you know, Ireland's, Ireland has tourism. Eh -eh, not at the moment, especially with a green passport coming down the road. Scrap yes. it. What, what have we got here? You know, we, we produce enough food at the moment to feed 25 million people. You know, there's new routes that have after opened up into Flanders and into Spain shipping. So there's all this stuff that is developing. And instead of talking about, as you say, you know, cyber or the lockdown, whatever, our government should be going, okay, what what is the future? And and 
on our communications, the government have never invested anything on our communications. Like I'm sure MI5 are tapping into all our communications and they could switch it off at a drop of a hat because there was no investment over here on it. So the future is the young people. We've said that before. Now, is anybody even speaking to them? The only thing that we're complaining to them is that they're out having fun and laughing and joking, you know, and 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 socializing, and <laughs> yeah. you know, we're 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 giving out about them. But and and, and they banned the bandstand. Stephen's doing for them as well. Yes, yeah. yes, because it, you know, <laughs> one with that as well. I just want to with the young people and with housing and. What's your thoughts, both of your, your thoughts on these uh, cuckoo investments that are creeping into the country and taking over all the apartments? Brian, we'll start out with yourself. It's not new, Joe. That's well, the scary new. piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like people People only came really to when all those houses were bought in Minute recently. Okay, that was the one I think that really focused people's minds. But actually, if you if you read different property reports, um, uh, Hooker McDonald have a report that will show you the amount of apartments that have been built and nobody is building apartments today where they don't have a buyer a forwarder they're not getting built they're either being sold to a particular group or they're already sold to individuals off the plans the problem that you have is that the only occupiers are now being priced out of the market and now they can't afford it and great you can go into one of these apartments and a long-term uh, rental agreement, which is really good, and I, and, I, and I love that. But my challenge is, well, if you're there and you're 70 or you're 65, how are you going to pay two and a half grand a month in rent when you're on a pension? There's nobody thinking of the long-term solution here. Um, so it's not new. It's been happening since 2018 that I know of. As, you know, obviously, I've been in the lending property game um, so it wasn't a surprise to me. And I think it's going to continue. And I think Michal Martin said something in the doll probably less than a week ago in a, uh, in question time. And and he threw his hands up in the air and he went, well, we have to build houses. Some We have to deliver houses in some way. And this is the way they're going to do it. And that's their plan. So there's no point in people. I don't mean there's no point in people arguing, but that is the government strategy. Anybody come in. Anybody build a house, it doesn't matter where you're going to buy it. It doesn't matter where you're going to rent it. It'll be somewhere for you to rest your head. Yeah, it's it's the old you know saying, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. I'll give so it to you. Th- yeah. That's what it is. What about that, Eddie, yourself? Well, I mean, it's unfortunately, I mean, we've been having this discussion for generations. It's the old hotbed of ideology as soon as you get into housing. And you have to try and screen, up, screen past all the bullshit and ideology both, on both sides, you know. Uh, so the idea, for example, that uh, that that government can start, you know, local governments can start building houses. I mean, they, they can't even build public toilets like they don't have the actual capacity. Right. They subcontract to the private sector. That's all we've been running the gap. Right. Since since the 70s. Right. And so that's not going to happen. So the, the idea of the hard left that somehow you just come and sprinkle the public sector fairy dust on the housing problem and it will spring up all these houses. That's just that's just. To, in order to get elected. On the other side, what we did was, and I'm not a developer at all, it was, we took, because when I did rip off Republic back in 2005 in, into the core of all this, yeah. we, we took out all, and the politicians took out all the developers and bankers, but especially developers, and publicly executed them after the global financial crisis. You know, development land tax was 90%. Remember that? Well, we were going to hammer the out of these people and show them who was in charge of the place, right? And then suddenly they stop building houses. And I'm wondering, who the housing deficit? Well, of course, have you stupid, right? Yeah. I mean, if you stop building houses, you have a housing deficit. We have a young country, massive skills, and I don't think, and I totally agree with your idea of the young people. You deal with, I think they're fantastic. You talk to audiences of young people, they'll blow you away. Yeah. They'll blow you away, yeah. right? We have this fantastic resource. They need housing. My oldest fella, he's gone. He's left Ireland. He's 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 working in another European country with his girlfriend. Why? Because he's a computer scientist, right? Because he was looking at Dublin saying, I can't, this is crazy. And mm-hmm. he was right. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't need his old fella to do the maths for him. He was gone, right? And uh, and and you're right. We are going to get people leaving Ireland because they can't afford to live here. Now, okay. the only good thing is that we might get some 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 evolving movement out into other parts of the country, get away from DC, because it's really a Dublin problem. 
and and get you know and start moving our economy. Like go back to the issue of long term planning, which 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 we came up earlier on. Now, yeah. when you're a doctor or a dentist or an architect or an engineer or whatever profession you're in, you have to do you have to get qualified to do it. And then you're subject to CPD, continuous professional development for anybody who hasn't been subject to it. It's an ongoing requirement to make sure that you're kept up to speed and your skills are sharp and you don't fall asleep on the wheel. But we elect people into the doll. We give them multi-billion euro projects and complex enterprises to manage. And the only reason they're in politics a lot in the first case is because they fell into it because they weren't bloody good at doing anything else. Right. Yeah. This is our issue. Right. Now, there are other countries where you can't get into politics without being qualified in public administration. And then you are subject to CPD. Right. So yeah. we have to, so the whole political system. What, our outcomes are a continuous function of the of the political system. And so long as the political system remains in the, in, in the patterns, it is, we're going to continue to repeat this. Sponsored by the Dunleary Rattown Local Enterprise Office. You're listening to Business Eye on Dublin South FM. I first moved to Ireland 21 years ago and, and, and I was here for seven, went to Australia for 10, been back for five. And the conversations that I heard on the radio, because I listened to radio all day long, were exactly the same in 20, 20, 2000 and 2007. And th- th- this morning I'm hearing about the leaving cert and delays in results and all that sort of stuff. The housing crisis has been the same for 21 years, right? It hasn't changed one iota since I first came 21 years ago. And it is the political system. So h- how is that going to be changed when the people who need to change it are the people in there? Like, h- how can this be changed? Well, the people themselves, right? At the end of the day, if people change their systems, right? The systems will, will will do, the organism will always try to survive and grow its own power and grow its own status and grow its own numbers. Bureaucracies are self-growing organisms, right? So all you have to do is watch Yes Minister, which is which is the training program for our civil servants, right? And, and that's how it operates. So you don't fix things just by throwing more money at it, right? You have yeah. to look at places like Estonia. Oh, they did it, right? Completely electronic. Uh, how the Finns, same size economy as us, largely the same blend, best education results in Europe, fantastic health system, built a new hospital for about a quarter of what we're building National Children's Hospital for. Mm. It's all being done, right? And so therefore the models are there. We have these fantastic young people also going into the public sector, well capable of doing all this. But unfortunately, we, we, have, we don't have a meritocracy. We have a system... Yeah which rewards longevity. Yeah. Now, when, 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 when it comes to political reform, well, I mean, like, if you get up in the stumps in any constituency in Ireland I, right now, right, and you say, listen, I have this great 20-year plan, and it is, you're gone. You won't even yeah, get yeah. the second half of the sentence out, right? You have to start talking about, I'm going to get your house. You know, we're going to improve the payments. You're going, like, it's, it's about delivering the lolly back to the constituency. And then you see this, it drives me nuts. You see this thing then after general election, all this about, well, we don't have a minister over in the West. Well, feck you in your West, right? Yeah. It's not about the minister bringing back the goodies to the local. Cons- that's that's why we're in the mess we're in. It should be about it should be about a debate about policy, right? And funding the policy. And but it's never about that. It's always about the, the circus around the personalities. I remember at the launch of my well, last thing. Remember at the launch of the Insolvency Act in two thousand and twelve, which I've been campaigning for and writing about. I wrote a book actually, brought it up in emergency in two thousand and nine, called Debt Busters. How to manage the crisis, right? Because we had we had draconian, we had v- beyond Victorian rules around insolvency, including the Sheriffs Act mm-hmm. from from at, from the time of King John being applied, right? So we finally brought out an insolvency act. It wasn't right. It what didn't get the balance right between mm-hmm. the powers to the main banks and the powers of the debtors and all, all the rest of it. I was at the launch of that. I went along. The two ministers came in. It was. Um, it was uh, Noonan and um, uh, uh, and the Justice Minister at the time, and uh, and the PAC came in, right? They were just launching their most important piece of financial legislation for consumers in Ireland in my lifetime. There was two questions, two questions, intelligent questions put to them, right, uh, to the two ministers by the by by about a pack of about fifty, right, and then. The rest of the hour was spent talking about bad relationships between the Department of Justice and the Department of Finance. And could they comment on that? Because the political correspondence knew as much about 
um, you know, knew as much about policy as we know about flying to Mars. Yeah, right? yeah. And that's our political coverage. So it's entertainment. It's a circus. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm Joe. You're, you're, I'm, on you're, mute, you're, Joe. Helping, you're helping me get it all out. Setting it <laughs> out. Here, one of one of the things as well. We, you're talking about political parties, but it. You know, it. I've always said it's not. They're the, they're the puppets. You know, they're they're the ones that are on stage. It's the top civil servants that are behind them and the top civil servants that are running the country. Mm. You know, there's if you look at there's people who are advising the government, you know, you'll see them in the papers every day. But, you know, they have huge influence like um, Martin, Martin Fraser mm. uh, would have huge influence within the government. Yeah. Um, and people forget about, you know, these are the people that have been there a long time and have massive influence on, on our political parties. And they need to be questioned. You know, they're hidden in the background, but people need to start asking questions about them and their policies well, which, as well. Can I just say, well, which people? I mean, you're talking there, Joe, about, about the Irish people. Us, us, yeah. people, us, yeah. us, the Brian, people. you were going to say something. I was going to say, Joe, you've got the public servants and the senior people in the civil service, okay, who are there for... Very, very long time. As Eddie said, they, they're probably there because of longevity. And, you know, they were the next person to get the job and the next person to get the job. And then you have a load of non-elected, not civil servant advisors that the ministers and the, politi the politicians bring in. And you don't know, is that your mate? What qualification do they have to give you this particular uh, advice on, on whatever it is that you're supposed to be the minister for? But and I don't want to I don't want to pick out one particular place. But if you look at what happened in the HSC and the cyber issue, everybody knew in the HSC that some computers were still running on Windows Seven and Windows ninety eight. Yeah, everybody knew that in the civil service. Yeah. Okay. Now there's probably other departments that are the same. Who is accountable? Just in the day to day, forget the political, whatever it is people are running these organizations and getting very well paid for it. Yeah. Look, is it look, the government that's not spending the money? Look, there's but, stories that we could all tell about people working in civil servants who complained about something in the department and they were moved to another department where correct. they had no work to do because they put correct. in a complaint. So, yep. as my mum, right. God rest her soul, used to say, a job for the old boys. You know, that's it. Yeah. Political parties on it. Can I, can I ask you both a, a quick question and just pivot just quickly? Bank mm -hmm. the banks. And I might start with Brian. And if you can both try and answer with three bullet points, right? This is not easy to do, but three bullet points. Why are the banks leaving Ireland? We know that two have just announced. Because they can. Why? They can in, three, they can. In, th <laughs> in three bullet points. Three bullet points. They don't care. They don't want to be here. And they're being asked by the central bank. Um, being beaten to death by the central bank by, you know, ridiculous regulation, and they're having to keep too much uh, tier capital in place compared to their competitors. Okay, and Eddie, <laughs> that, well, the, the, banks, banks like any industry leaves the country when they can't make money and they don't see a future for themselves. I mean, it's just a logical business decision. It's not. Don't take it personally. Like I mean, that's just the way mm -hmm. it is. But you're right, and uh, Brian has his finger on the pulse there. I mean, the, the central banks. In my opinion, I, I'd love to see a study of how many people applied to come into the Republic of Ireland since Brexit to set up insurance businesses here, which would improve the competition and driven down prices. Actually, walked up, walked the door, gave up their vacation. They were they were sick and tired of dealing with with a financial regulator that wants to be the hardest the hardest cop on the beach in Europe. And actually, there was there was, a, there, there was an article Eddie around that uh, insurance that loads of people had applied. And they made a complaint to the central bank that it was taking 14 months yeah. for an application to be approved because they didn't have enough people working in the department. And the answer from the central bank was, that's not true. That's all they said. That's well, of course, it would be, yeah. Well, that's the, the central bank is, you know, it's yeah. a law, is a world is a world and a law unto itself. It runs its own star chamber, yeah. you know, and it, 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 it you know, and, and it has has a kangaroo coat over it as well like it does its own thing and we're supposed to take what it says as uh yeah that's well no i'm regulated by the central bank so you know they won't particularly like what i'm saying Me too. About, you know yeah so you so but but i'm quite realistic about them right and and you can see where the central bank lie now and all, this whole this whole business coming up about the mis-selling of loan notes and all the rest of it right it's just quiet right uh and and, and it oughtn't to be 
but uh, not to get sidetracked to come back to your three bullet points the second reason why i think why um why banks you know it's a, it's about the it's about the size of the republic of ireland as well the economies of scale and trying to get rooted here but like so long as you've got state investment in the two main banks and and effectively the the ugly sister of the central bank to the department of finance riding shotgun for the two main banks which by the way is why the insolvency act they made such a <laughs> of it right um, I mean, that it, it's set up to make it very, very difficult for external competitors to come in. Uh, yep. So that, that's, that's, that's the second reason. Is there a third reason? I don't think so. You lose money if you stay here. You can't get in if you want to get in. Uh, and and, and, and that, that's, that's the beginning of the end of it. But however, the hope is that DeFi, decentralized finance, is coming in pretty rapidly. And the old infrastructure of the bank where you had to go through, you know, physical property, and then it has to go through credit committees and, and all this kind of stuff. That's going to be taken out of it in a lot in a large part of, um, of banking by decentralized finance. And, um, you know, the whole development of blockchain and Ethereum and, and, and all of that. And you, you can see that happening pretty rapidly globally. So I think that the banks in five or 10 years time will be completely different from the banks today. And, yeah. uh, and the players will be completely different and the young people will be driving it, not us old fellas. I, I think that the world um, and Ireland will be in a, in a different place within the next 10 years. And what happens, I believe, in the next two years, um, good or bad, will set, will set, that, set that journey. And I think that's where now I'll go back to uh, where I think people now need to be more vocal. And when I say people, I mean us, people of Ireland, and man and woman, men and woman, we need to be more vocal. Folks, we've run out of time. We've run out of time. Um, this, this into this, uh, we could go on, and hopefully, I can. We can get both of you on again um, at a later date to continue on this conversation because I do want to talk to you, both of you about Davos and the Great Reset as well. So, um, oh. Brian's been reading up on it. Stephen, uh, Simon's <laughs> been reading up on it as well. I haven't so, been sleeping, Joe. Sleeping. I haven't been so, sleeping. So, so ready? We'll I'll, have, I'll have to come into that one, stroking my cat. I'll yes. have to come into that one, stroking. <laughs> yes, we'll. we'll uh, I'll wear my. I'll wear my uh, Star Trek uh, outfit for that as well. But <laughs> gentlemen, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for the show.